everyone, and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. We join you today from the North Central Research Station at La Homa for the annual Wheat Field Day. And for the first time in many years, it's cloudy, it's been misting, and the fields are muddy. We begin today with a discussion on varieties. Here's SUNUP's Dave Deacon and our Small Grains Extension Specialist, Jeff Edwards. It's been an interesting year for wheat, and Jeff, Let's talk about what we have here at, at Lahoma. You guys have a pretty consistent study going. Uh, we have. This has historically been our largest wheat variety trial site. This year we have 56 varieties out here, the largest trial we've ever had at this site. And in addition, in addition to just having those 56 varieties out here, we have every variety with and without a foliar fungicide. Can't wait till June rolls around to, to get in here and harvest these plots and see what type of an effect foliar fungicides had this year. Uh, there are some varieties out here, Billings being an example, that the disease really hasn't affected much and I don't look for much response at all. And then we have other varieties, uh, Pete or Garrison being an example, where I expect to see a very large response, maybe 20 or 25 percent increase with yield for using a foliar fungicide. Who would have thought that, that, that there would be that much difference between foliar and non-foliar? Uh, we, we certainly didn't expect it earlier in the year, and that's one thing that's catching a lot of our producers in Oklahoma this year. Mm -hmm. At the time when we really needed to make those foliar fungicide applications, we were still extremely dry, right. and it was we were in pretty dire straits. Uh, so growers held off, and understandably so. They didn't want to put more money into the crop. Then we started getting rain, and we have had an ideal environment for stripe rust. Cool conditions, a lot of free moisture, and it really came on, and we're, we're past that fungicide window, mostly in Oklahoma now. Uh, so hindsight's 2020, and, and we'll just have to ride this one out and see what happens. Let's talk about that moisture being a, a big difference between 2014 and 2015. What other differences are you seeing in the wheat crop? Well, uh, this year, we're, we're certainly, with the moisture, we're going to have a much better seed set. I think we'll have much larger kernel size, uh, so we're going to have better seed quality going into the fall and also going into the mill as well. Uh, no disease last year. We have a lot of disease this year. Uh, one disease that might show up this year would be head scab, and we haven't really dealt with head scab in Oklahoma for seven or eight years. It's not a disease other than northeast Oklahoma that we typically worry about. And of course, at this stage, the dye is cast. We'll just have to ride it out. But having free moisture at the time the wheat is flowering, if you're no-till into corn stalks or no-till into wheat, there's potential there. Uh, I still think it will primarily be an issue in northeast Oklahoma, eastern Kansas, but it's something to keep on the radar screen. As, as we're approaching the middle of May, how much more time until you think combines are going to start rolling? Well. Somebody will, will cut wheat, you know, prior Way too to, early. Well, yeah, somebody will <laughs> cut wheat prior, prior to Memorial Day just to say that they did. Uh, if the current conditions continue, I think we might have a little bit of a later harvest. We might be into that second week of June before we really get going. And that's a good thing as long as it's because the wheat is taking that long to mature. The longer the wheat is green, the more kernels it's making or the more weight it's putting into those kernels. So that's a good thing. Uh, now hopefully we won't have a late harvest because the fields are, are too muddy. You, know, it, we can't, you can't please a farmer. We were complaining about no rain and, and now it's, it's maybe a little too wet, but we're, we're a long way off from worrying about that. But that might be a concern if, if we continue to stay wet throughout the month of May. Well, thank you, Jeff. Jeff Edwards, our Small Grains Extension Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. I'm Al Sutherland with your Mesonet Weather Report. From drought to flood, our recent rains have recharged dry soils, pushed rivers and creeks past flood stage, and added much needed water to Oklahoma's many lakes. A map of soil moisture at 10 inches from Wednesday, May 12th is wonderfully boring. 
There are only two dry locations, Canton at three tenths and Boise City at two tenths across the entire state. Mesonet soil moisture is reported as fractional water index ranging from one, a saturated soil, to zero, a very dry soil. A map showing the seven-day change in fractional water index at 10 inches shows where some of the drier soils were. They lie in the green-colored areas that showed an increase in soil moisture from May 6th through May 12th. A map of the percent of plant available water from the surface down to 16 inches is equally wonderfully boring. Dark green indicates very high soil moisture. Most locations are in the upper 90s to 100 percent of the water they can hold. More rain on soils that are already at water holding capacity means more runoff will continue to fill ponds, streams, and lakes. Here's Gary with a look at the latest drought monitor and Oklahoma lake levels. Thanks, Alan. Good morning, everybody. Well, we've certainly gotten the rain we wish for and then, then some. Uh, we got more than what we bargained for in some places, need a little bit more in others, but we also have a lot of drought on its way out across Oklahoma. So let's take a look at that latest drought monitor map and see where we're at. Well, this is probably the best looking drought monitor map I've seen since late January 2014. Back then, only 38% of the state was in drought, but we had a lot more uh, of that red color in Oklahoma back then. Now we just have a few pockets up in north central Oklahoma, uh, Kay and Grant counties, and then also out in the far western panhandle. So that rainfall has done its work. The drought is uh, being removed pretty rapidly across Oklahoma. So we just, you know, keep it going into the summer and, and uh, hopefully we can start again in the fall. Now this rain is eradicating the short-term and long-term drought uh, impacts. Uh, the long-term, of course, the reservoirs. This latest uh, reservoir level map looks wonderful. It's still low across western Oklahoma, but some of those lakes like uh, Luger at Altus is up 11 feet since late March. Tom Steed up six feet. Canton still needs to come up pretty rapidly. It's only two feet higher. And finally, one of those short-term benefits is the greening up of Oklahoma, so no more fire danger worries, uh, at least for a few months. Take a look at this greenness map from the OK Fire Program uh, from uh, May 12th last year. You can see all that orange in the northwestern half of the state. That was when we were having all those fires across the northwestern half of the state. And then if you look at the May 11th map uh, for this year, you can see basically almost the entire state, nice and green, no fire danger. Uh, too much water in places, that's a good problem to have in some cases, um, but uh, the short-term short and long-term impacts have been alleviated to uh, a large degree. So summer's looking a lot nicer now that we're uh, through the first couple of weeks of May. Um, we hope this rainfall continues through June, uh, and you know, let's get this drought out of here once and for all. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. We're joined now by Chad Penn, a soil chemist here at Oklahoma State University. And Chad, you've been studying land application of water-based drilling mud for a few years now. You have some research set up here at Lahoma. Talk about how you set up this study and kind of what your thoughts were going into it. We established these plots about two and a half years ago. Um, initially, it was a study looking at the timing of water-based mud application to wheat. At, um, we applied the mud at different stages, and um, in that year we, we harvested the, the wheat and um, determined the, the treatment effects of different, different rates of salt application on the, on the wheat. And um, it turned out that initially, uh, for the first year, there wasn't much, there was, there was no statistical difference uh, between uh, plots that had received water-based mud and those that had not received it. When we used application rates of the full uh, legal limit in the state of Oklahoma, 6,000 pounds of total salt per acre. Also used two thirds of that rate and on the, obviously control. Uh, and then the following year, we didn't apply any, any more mud, but we maintained the plots and we continued to monitor them and also monitor the soils. And the bare spots, we had these bare spots that developed from excessive uh, sodium absorption ratio, or, or in other words, the soil became um, saturated with a bit too much uh, uh, sodium in these spots. And while that's not a problem for wheat that's already established, it created a very uh, difficult environment for the wheat seed to germinate. So 
it turned out that uh, when uh, uh, Google took their aerial imagery in, in uh, March of 2014, we could actually see the overlay of the plots. We could actually determine, uh, we could overlay our plots on it and see the plot treatments. Um, we could see a lot of bare spots even from the satellite images. So is that concerning to you as a researcher? Yeah, this is, this is information that we didn't, that, you know, I was uh, oblivious to. You know, the first year when we applied it to a standing wheat crop, we, we didn't really see reductions in yield and everything was fine. We, we I, you know, at that point I hadn't been thinking uh, ahead of, you know, what, what might the soil environment be like for a germinating seed. The salt leached out, uh, mostly, and uh, we thought everything was fine. Um, also, our grass plots, which we have established at the, at the Lahoma Station, and in follow-up years, there was no problem with those either. But again, the difference between wheat and grass is, uh, obviously with wheat, you're, it's an annual crop, and you're trying to germinate, sow a seed every single year. With grass, you don't, you don't have that problem. But we would have never known this if we hadn't maintained these plots and continued to monitor them. Most of the bare spots have, have gone away. Um, we'll have more information after weed harvest this year and it's absolutely necessary to have rainfall, adequate rainfall to, uh, to kind of uh, um, recoup that soil and move those salts out of the profile. If a producer is considering having drilling mud applied to their land, what should they consider? The most important thing to consider is the quality of the operator. Uh, there's, a, there's, there's many different land application companies throughout the state and uh, some of them are, are very high quality, extremely professional. However, there are, there's evidence of a lot of uh, land application companies that uh, do not have very good quality control and as a result, you know, there's, uh, unfortunately, there's a, a fair number of sites that uh, end up having problems where the soils become burned up from, uh, from excessive salt application. So do your homework. <laughs> yes, the best thing to do is check with your neighbors to see what their experience was like. Now you've studied this a couple of years. You'll, you're entering into year three. What will you look at now? After the, we'll make a decision after the, uh, the weed harvest this year. Okay. If we continue to see differences in yield between plots that receive the highest rate of mud, uh, 6,000 pounds of salt per acre, and, and, and the control, then what we might do is, is till half the plots. Part of the reason why we're, we see some of these bare spots is because we didn't till these plots. We did that on purpose because we wanted to be able to come back and, uh, and, and, and measure exactly uh, uh, how far the salt has moved through the soil profile. Again, if the, if the yields are low this year, we'll probably till half the plots and compare it. Okay. And you and the team have put together some fact sheets and more information that uh, producers can access, so we have those available too? Yeah, there, there's a couple fact sheets, I'm working on a couple more, and there's also a, uh, a webinar that's, uh, that's posted on, on uh, OSU's extension website. Okay, Chad Penn, thanks a lot. Keep us posted on how things turn out here. And for a link to those fact sheets and for more information on water-based drilling mud application, go to sunup.okstate.edu. The latest WASD production report came out, and Kim, what was in that report that you saw? Well, I don't think there was many surprises. Uh, the ending stocks were higher than expected, uh, both for the 14-15 uh, uh, marketing year, which, which will be ending up at the uh, end of this month, and the 15-16 year. Uh, you know, next year's ending stocks is uh, projected to be up in the upper end of uh, the 700 million, just pretty close to eight. That's, a, that's quite a bit of wheat. You look at uh, production, uh, USDA came out with uh, Oklahoma near 119 million bushels. <laughs> what, five or six weeks ago, we were talking about eight 80 million and hoping maybe we get 85 or so. And I was talking to a farmer here today and, mm -hmm. and he said that, you know, the, the wheat that was falling in sorghum it would just look like death warmed over and he's going to get a crop out of it. However, he says it may be July before he gets to cut that wheat. And, and you know, I've heard other people talk about sucker heads coming up mm -hmm. and you're going to have some, some uh, mature wheat ready to harvest and some that's going to be green and that could cause us some problems. So that could push back harvest a little bit more and could that affect the price of wheat? I think it can extend harvest and that may be what the market's looking at. 
looking at. You know, we got a rally at the end of the week. Uh, the value of the dollar fell. I think the funds are driving the price now. You know, they're they're they've got record short positions, mm -hmm. sold positions, and as they come out of those, we could get rallies. But that uh, market uh, July contract got above five dollars and twenty cents. That five twenty is critical. If we can hold that into next week, then I think we're looking pretty good. Okay. Well, we'll let you get back to the grain grading school here in Enid. Thank you very much, Kim Anderson, grain marketing specialist here at Oklahoma State University. It may not be best to ask a rancher in February and March how calving season's going because he may have just spent the previous night in bone chilling cold trying to help a uh, two year old heifer that needed his assistance. But now, here in May, I think is a pretty good time to look back at the previous calving season, see what problems we had, and if there's some ways that we can change our management and reduce those problems for future years. One of the things that I would spend some time is to look at our calving book, and especially pay attention to if we lost some calves, when did we lose them? Was it a situation where our losses all occurred at the time of calving, actual delivery? And were those calves born to young cows, two and three year olds? That's an indication to me that we may want to reevaluate our breeding program. Make sure that we have calving ease bulls matched up with those replacement heifers so that we reduce the possibility of calving difficulty in those heifers in subsequent years. Did we lose some calves as they got to be two to three weeks of age, which of course indicates that we may have had some calf diarrhea, some disease problems in those calves. Then there's some whole different management ideas that I think we should take into consideration to try to prevent that from occurring in the, in the future. Are we calving in the same area? every year to where there might be a buildup of pathogens in the soil uh, in that particular calving pasture to where we're actually bringing back the, the same problems year after year. If we have a lot of calf diarrhea issues, especially in larger herds, I'd encourage you to learn about what's called the Nebraska Sandhill Calving System. And it's a pretty complicated system that requires lots of different pastures that uh, basically the concept is that we are not allowing young baby newborn calves to be exposed to those the calves that were born earlier in that calving season. It's a complicated system like I said and you can learn more about it by going to the SUNUP show links at sunup.okstate.edu. Look under show links and we've put a, a connection there to where you can read and learn more about that Sandhill calving system. Also, if you have an issue with calf diarrhea year after year, I'd really uh, suggest that you spend some time with your local veterinarian and perhaps talk about some of the ways that you might make changes. And that could include the calf scours vaccinations that are available to give to the cows six weeks or more prior to the start of the calving season. I think that's just a stopgap measure uh, one that uh, can help you through a particular year, but you still want to consider what are the issues that are causing our situation to continually have this issue of calf diarrhea every year. It may be nutritional with the cows, it may be, have something to do with the location, but by looking through this and working with your local veterinarian, I think you can help prevent it uh, to a certain degree. We hope this gives you some ideas about looking back at this past calving season and working towards preventing some of those problems next year. And we look forward to visiting with you again next week on SUNUP's Cow Calf Corner. New livestock and meat trade data has been released in the past few days and joining us now to help sort it all out is Daryl Peel, our livestock marketing specialist. And Daryl, in looking at those numbers, let's start with what the export picture is looking like. 
Well, beef exports are down so far this year. You know, that's to be expected. It's part of the general market conditions. We have record high prices and limited supplies right now. Exports were, were almost unchanged last year. They're down about 10% for the year to date. March numbers specifically were down about 6 to 7%. Uh, which is, all things considered, I believe, holding up pretty well. Uh, you know, the, the Asian markets, Japan is uh, actually up slightly, about 1% for the year to date. South Korea is just down slightly. Uh, but in other markets like Mexico, we're seeing a much sharper decrease. Hong Kong is also down significantly this year. And then in terms of imports, what are you observing? Well, again, as expected, with record high prices and limited supplies, we're attracting more product from the global market. So imports are up. Uh, they were up last year. They'll be up even more this year. Uh, so far this year, we're, uh, we're up about 47% year to date. Uh, March numbers were up about 33%. Much of that increase is coming from Australia. Uh, Australia is in the position right now of liquidating cattle because of drought, so they've got increased supplies, at least in the short run, and so we're getting a lot of that meat in the U.S. right now. Uh, those will probably moderate as we go through the year a little bit. New Zealand is up, uh, Mexico is up, so it, most of our major uh, import markets are sending more beef to the U.S. right now in response to the high prices here. Are you seeing a similar trend with the live cattle trade picture? We are, uh, you know, last year we imported more cattle from Mexico and Canada. Uh, we, we are up so far this year as well. Um, you know, imports of cattle from Mexico are all feeder cattle. Uh, the thing that's changed from last year to this year in both the Mexican and Canadian import, uh, cattle import situation is that we're getting less females from both of those countries this year. The heifers are, are down, so it probably is an indication that we're seeing some herd expansion beginning in both Mexico and Canada. And then in terms of beef demand, I know this time of year we like to grill out and as we head into summer, is that impacting beef demand overall? You know, beef demand appears to be very strong, uh, and, and this despite concerns we've had, particularly in 2015, with increased the supplies of pork and poultry. Uh, exports are down for both of those meats, so we're consuming more of that increased production in the U.S., um, and yet despite that, beef prices are high. The, uh, the calculated beef demand index for the first quarter of this year was up sharply, and so it says that, uh, you know, with limited supplies of beef, demand remains very strong for that available supply, despite the fact that there's lots of pork and poultry out there as well. Okay. We head into grilling season. Of course, we love this time of year. Daryl, thanks a lot. We'll see you again soon. You may be familiar with the old rule of two pounds of N per bushel, but Brian, that may not be the rule anymore. Now, you know, the yield goal estimate, two pounds of N per bushel, that rule of thumb is significantly better than just a random guess. Right. Pulling it out of thin air. But it's not the best case scenario. The long-term trials that we have across the state, especially here at Lahoma with the 502 that was started by Dr. Billy Tucker in 1970, provides us so much information to look at nitrogen response and nitrogen need over time. So while if we average 10 years, 15 years of data, it'd probably come out to two pounds of N per bushel right at that mark. But if we look at every year by itself, separate it out, we go from years where one year it took 1.1 pounds of nitrogen to push produce 85 bushel of wheat, mm -hmm. while two years later it took 100 pounds of nitrogen uh, to produce 35 bushel, which is basically three pounds of N per bushel. So our year-to-year -year variability due to soil moisture, due to rainfall, due to environment, due to all these factors goes in together, it really does not keep that two pounds of N per bushel. We as producers and as um, better as managers of the environment and of our, our soils and of our systems need to do a better job of accounting for the temporal variability. Right now, precision ag is all about spatial. We get it in the right place where it needs to be across the field. That's not the whole, the whole story. We need to also think about the right year and the right time. And with that, it leads into the perfect transition to Enrich Strip and Green Seeker <laughs> Sensor. Right. You know, that's what the Green Seeker and Enrich Strip gets at, is that right year, the right rate for the right place in the right year. Well, and this is a tool that's been, you know, going on in, in, into the producer's fields yeah. over the past what, five, 10 years, and, and it's, it's showing promise. Yeah, we've been doing Enrich Strip since 2002, 2003 across Oklahoma. We've got half a million acres approximately in the state right now. I'd love to see two and a half million. It's such an easy process. There's no reason why we don't have more acres. Uh, whether they use a green seeker sensor or not, it's just a, it's an easy guide. If you see a strip that's greener and you know there's more nitrogen there, we apply more nitrogen. If you don't see it, you can make that call. Do you want more nitrogen or not? 
Okay, and, and speaking of uh, some of the nutrients going into the soil, we've had quite a bit of rain, and, and back whenever it was really dry, you mm -hmm. said, don't, don't put anything down, the soil's not ready for it, but has, has this recent moisture zapped that? So what we'll see with this recent moisture is kind of a two or three fold. One, we have the leaching process. Mm -hmm. We have been getting the slow rains, pushing our mobile nutrients down the soil profile. So that means our nitrate, our sulfate, our chlorides, our borons are moving down the soil profile. Are they out of root to reach? Ah, it depends on what you're talking about. You know, we'll move down the profile. There'll be some left in the top. We aren't just completely depleting our topsoil, but the N, the S, the chloride, the boron, it has been moving down. If we go into a dry spell, it's going to come right back up. Okay. One thing that we have have has happened is that we've gone from a dry soil that may not have had much soil moisture and re-wetted it. And with going into the summer, this late spring, going into summer, we're going to have temperatures. That means we're going to start breaking down organic matter or tying up. So we're kicking our nitrogen cycle and the organic matter cycle into gear, whether it's breaking it down. Uh, and tying nitrogen up through immobilization or whether we're releasing it through uh, mineralization. Are you seeing a difference between conventional till and no-till when it comes to that? Uh, yes, no. As much as anything, it's been more of a cropping system. Okay. Uh, things following summer crops this year tended to have much more of a higher nitrogen need. Uh, the summer crops benefited from a really good release of organic matter last year. So I saw a greater need in those falling summer crops than I did falling winter crops. The no-till is more of a moisture management. Some of the no-till acres held on a little bit longer in some cases uh, if, if the previous crop had been terminated right. And so the demand was a little bit higher because they had grown a little bit more. Okay, so takeaway is the, the, the old rule of thumb on, on N may not be true, but the, the green seeker and the enriched strip is the way to go. Absolutely. Thank you, Brian Arnell, soil nutrient specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Thanks so much for joining us this week. A reminder, you can find us anytime on our website, sunup.okstate.edu, and also follow us on YouTube and social media. From the North Central Research Station at Lahoma, I'm Lyndall Stout. And we'll see you next time at SUNUP. We leave you with a few parting shots from Lahoma, where construction will soon begin on a new research facility, honoring the life's work of the late Raymond Sidwell, who managed the research station in the heart of Oklahoma wheat country from June of 1980 until his passing in December of 2013.